Man, I am really glad that you're here to worship with us today. Happy New Year, by the way. I'm excited that you've chosen to begin your, your year, at least your, uh, your year in church with us. We're glad to have you here and excited about what we're going to dive into, not just this week, but in the, in the weeks to come. Let me mention a couple of things to you that I think are, are important. One is that we've got 15 or 16 of our uh, middle school, high school, and leaders who are at a conference this weekend, and we're just really praying for them, praying for safety as they travel, but praying too that this is just really an energizing time and a spiritually focused time for them. Um, also, uh, if you were with us through the month of December, you know that we were doing some fundraising to to really have an impact in Kenya. There's a church there that we have partnered with. I've been there a couple of times. Gail went with me last year. There are 23 orphans that stay in a home uh, that is 18 by 22 square feet. They sleep on a dirt floor, on mats, and there's just a desperate need there. We want to build a home for them. And our goal, uh, because obviously construction is much different there than here, was to raise about $14,000. I was looking into the possibility of a grant to come alongside uh, to maybe match some funds because I didn't think uh, maybe we'd be able to bite off that big of a chunk after all the other things we did this fall. And you guys are just crazy. Um, we raised almost $14,400. Uh, and so, man, we're going to get that house built. So, yeah. Just really a beautiful thing. And I just uh, praise God for that. Um, I want to show you a quick video, and let me just explain to you real quickly. This is uh, just a real quick summary of folks who came into our church last year. Some were baptized and joined the church. Some placed their membership here. Sometimes there's a whole family picture. Maybe one person joined the church, but we're just trying to get to know names and faces and put all that together. So just uh, kind of want to explain that to you um, beforehand. But, but take a look at this. It's just, I think, encouraging to see what God's up to.
Well, back in the mid-1980s, Robert De Niro and Jeremy Irons starred in a movie that was called The Mission. Now, some of you remember that. Maybe it's a story of Rodrigo Mendoza. He was a Spanish slave trader. He was a mercenary in South America in the 1750s. Mendoza was a violent man. He was corrupt. He was just evil on so many different levels. And when he kills his own brother in a fit of rage, his life is just totally wrecked. He's overwhelmed by shame. He's overwhelmed with regret because of his past. And so he goes into seclusion. He just isolates himself from everybody. And sometime later, a priest named Father Gabriel came to him, challenged Mendoza to leave his past behind, actually to travel with him back to South America, this time not to enslave the natives that were living there, but rather to serve them. That this was a chance for him to start over again, to start a brand new life. And in many ways, that movie was a, was a beautiful picture of the gospel. However, because Mendoza had been a slave trader and because he had killed his own brother, there's a a profound scene in the movie where he's talking with Father Gabriel and he says to the priest, for me, there is no redemption. And Father Gabriel responds, you have chosen your crime. Do you have the courage to choose your penance? And Mendoza says, there is no penance hard enough for me. And he says, yeah, but, but do you dare to try? And so Mendoza travels with Father Gabriel back to the jungle, and yet to, to punish himself because of his sins, he drags a pile of, of, of armor, of, of scrap metal behind him up a mountainside. It is a grueling trip, but he is determined to pay for his past sins. Friends, I want you to think for a minute about this whole concept of penance. Some of you grew up with that regularly. Is penance biblical? Within the Roman Catholic Church, penance is one of seven sacraments or or seven sacred actions. Penance follows confession to a priest where the priest assigns various works to, to pay for the sins that have been committed. Penance might be reciting prayers. It might be fasting. It could be giving money. It could be performing works of mercy. According to the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, penance, quote, is, a, is God's gift to us so that any sin committed after baptism can be forgiven. In confession, and then subsequently penance, we have the opportunity to repent and recover the grace of friendship with God. One Catholic training manual put it this way, in the sacrament of penance, God gives the priest the power to bring sinners back into a state of grace and to prevent them from falling into the abyss of hell. Now, I want you to kind of let all that sink in. Penance means performing specific actions that earn God's forgiveness, that keep believers out of hell, and that win back God's friendship. That penance or good works bring believers back into a state of grace. Now, how can I put this? That's wrong. I mean, it's just wrong. And, And... If you think that I'm picking on people in the Catholic faith, man, I'm not. We all do this. I mean, come on, we do. We sin, we disappoint God, we feel guilty about it, and so we watch our mouth for a day or two. Want to clean up our act. We treat the kids nicer, or maybe our spouse. We don't kick the cat. You know, we, we, we put a few extra bucks in the offering plate because we think that if we're a better person, God will like us better. That if we just kind of do things better next time, that we can get God's favor back. But what does Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 say? It is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We don't earn forgiveness. It's a gift. Now, don't get me wrong. The book of James says that if we have received God's forgiveness and grace, then we're going to to perform righteous actions, right? They prove our allegiance to Christ. If we are not serving God in a tangible way, well, then you start to say, well, is your salvation real? Faith without works is dead, the Bible says. 
But friends, don't miss this. Forgiveness has absolutely nothing to do with our good works. It has everything to do with Christ's perfect work on the cross. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and he will forgive us our sins, and he will cleanse us or purify us from all unrighteousness. It does not say, if we confess our sins and drag some really heavy stuff up a mountain, then God will forgive us and purify us. It does not say, if we confess our sins and we say seven prayers, do three acts of mercy, and give $20 to the poor, then He will forgive our sins and purify us. Forgiveness is not about what we do. It's about what Christ has already done. Romans 3.24 says we are justified freely by his grace. Now, this does not mean that being a Christian is something that we take lightly, something that we treat flippantly, right? Just because, listen, just because grace is free does not mean it's cheap. We have to get our brains around this concept that there is nothing that we can do to earn grace or to pay for grace. It is a gift that we have to accept from the Lord. Have you guys heard the phrase, the butterfly effect? I asked several people that question this week, different ages. A lot of people had heard of it. Now, it was a movie back in 2004, but the concept's been around a lot longer than that. The butterfly effect is a way to look at the world. It suggests that something as small as the flutter of a butterfly's wings can ultimately reverberate around the globe until it becomes a typhoon. And now the concept itself can have negative connotations. It can kind of create a chaotic way of looking at things. But my takeaway from the butterfly effect is that sometimes little things, seemingly small decisions or chance encounters or maybe events from the past, good or bad, that that those things can have major repercussions in our lives later on. It's like a snowball that starts rolling down the hill and it gets bigger and bigger and ultimately it leads to an avalanche. The the flap of a a butterfly's wings can grow into something far greater. One little thing that changes everything. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament wrote this in 1 Corinthians 15.10. He says, God's grace to me was not without effect. God's grace was not without effect. And so we're calling this series the grace effect. What God did through Jesus on the cross, Jesus' death to pay the penalty for our sins, his victory over death that he proved through his resurrection. Your response to that, my response to that, changes everything. It's it's how we engage with grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor. It is unearned, it is undeserved, it's the blessing of God. It it kind of encapsulates the promises of God's forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternity in heaven. Friends, I'm telling you, if your life intersects with God's grace, I mean, really, really engages. Man, fasten your seatbelt and hold on tight because everything is about to change. When our lives intersect with God's grace, we're never the same. His grace is not without effect if we really embrace it. Now, we're beginning today with the grace that saves. We're going to talk in the coming weeks about the grace that transforms, the grace that empowers, the grace that sustains, and the grace that restores. But this amazing gift of grace, it's available to everybody on earth, but we have to receive it for ourselves. And once we we make the choice, well, then his grace unfolds in different ways at different times in our lives. But it begins with our surrender to Christ. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning. For some of you, this is going to be a review. You've heard this a thousand times. Maybe you've taught it over and over again. But I'm telling you, no decision is more important in life than the decision that you make about Jesus. And so for somebody here today, this might be the most important talk that you've ever heard. Not because I gave it, but because it is the gospel. See, the Bible teaches that all people everywhere have an eternal soul from the moment of conception. After death, we are going to spend eternity somewhere, either in heaven 
in the presence of God or we're going to spend eternity in hell shut out from the presence of God. And friends, I'm not looking at any faces in this room. I'm just playing the statistics. There is somebody in this room right now who's headed for hell. If things don't change, and maybe you know who you are, maybe you don't. Maybe you don't want to think about it because it's just too scary. But the reality is, certainly within the sound of my voice over the internet, you think about our community and the surrounding peoples, people that you work with, people that you love. There are people who have rejected this offer of grace. If I knock on your door and I've got a wrapped present, you come to the door, I say, hey, I've got a gift for you. You, you kind of have three opportunities uh, to, to respond. One is you just close the door. You say, no, thanks. I, I'm not interested in that. That's not for me. Or you could take it and say, oh, okay, thanks. And you close the door. You go in. You set it over in the corner. You never unwrap it. You, you kind of went through the motions, but you didn't really receive it. Or you can take the gift. You can open it. Whatever it is, it becomes yours. But that's kind of your opportunity to respond. And God says, I've got this awesome gift for you. I want to give you grace. And the truth is, a lot of people just say, no, thank you, and they close the door. Because it's intimidating. It's, it just seems too good to be true. They're afraid God's going to be too invasive in their lives. So a lot of people say no. What concerns me is that a lot of people say, yeah, okay, whatever. And they take it. Maybe they say a prayer, maybe they get dunked under the water, whatever, but they, they take the gift, they set it down, they never open it, they never look at it, it never has any impact on their lives, and it really doesn't mean a thing. Or some people receive the gift, they open it, it becomes theirs, and it changes everything. But those are our options. So what I want to do is I want to show you today, I hope in a logical progression of thought, what we believe about grace. If you got an update today, if, if one was given to you when you came in, on the back side of that is kind of a summary of the talk today. If you did not get one, hopefully there are more out at Welcome Central. You can pick one up as you leave because I want you to take this with you. I want you to have these verses. The Bible is a big book. Man, there's a lot of stuff in there. I just want to take you to one book in the Bible, the book of Romans. I want to walk you down through a series of verses that just give us some things to think about, okay? Kind of the summary verse for the whole thing, in my mind, is Romans 6, 23. It's printed right there on that sheet. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The result of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That's grace. And then the book of Romans helps us see how we intersect with grace. I want to start just very basically with this idea. The, the first key word is, is God. There is a God. Romans chapter 1 verse 20 says, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Paul says, you just look around at the world. You look at the design in the world, all that we know about the, the universe, all that's been created, and we say there, there, there has to be a designer. The more we learn about DNA, about the human body, about cells, it, it just proves more and more the incredible nature of all that's been created. A guy named William Paley used the illustration of a watch. He said, if you're walking through the desert and you find a watch, well, there's a couple of options. One, you could say, wow, over millions of years, the minerals in the ground here formed into the gears and the workings of the watch, and the sand must have gotten really hot and formed the glass of the crystal on that watch, and maybe an animal came along, you know, and he died long ways, and that it became the leather band of the watch. Now, you could say that, or you could say, you know, somebody probably pretty smart designed this watch, made this watch, looks like dropped it here in the desert. But that's the only two ways it gets there. And we just look at the world and we say, you know what, we believe there's a God. Somebody said that nature is God's braille to a blind world. But there's more. Because the second key word is sin, we have all failed God. Right? Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. A kid came home with his report card, had five F's on it. 
His dad said, son, how do you explain this? He said, I don't know, dad. Should we blame heredity or environment? (laughs) Man, everybody wants to blame, right? We're all victims. Instead of saying, you know what? I I failed. I I have sin in my life. There are things that that have violated God's plans for my life. If, If I gave you a scorecard, one through 10, and all we did was walk down through the Ten Commandments, and I said, hey, I just want you to keep track of all the ones you've never broken. And we talked that through. And then we're going to talk about it when we're finished. Several of you would choose to get up and go to the bathroom and then go out the back door and get in your car because you would not want to talk about that. I wouldn't want to talk about it. I wouldn't want to go down 1 through 10 and see how well I did, would you? When you start getting to things about lying. and You say adultery. Well, okay, I haven't done that one except that Jesus said that lust is adultery. Ouch. And then it just gets messier and messier. Nobody has ever told me that they were without sin. I had one lady tell me she had not sinned since she became a Christian, but since lying's a sin, I I wrote that one off. Okay. Yeah, I, I knew she was crazy. We're all sinners. Okay, we are all in the same boat, right? Doesn't matter. Good, bad, we're all in this together. Now, I will say this, because some of you are kind of tied into some deeper theology. We do not teach total depravity here. Total depravity suggests that every child that's born is born guilty of sin. It's why some churches, not all, but some churches, it's why they baptize babies. Because they believe that you're born guilty of sin. Jesus said, unless you become like a little child, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. We believe that babies are born pure. The catch is they're born with a sinful nature. Everybody has a sinful nature, so once you start to understand right from wrong, you're going to choose wrong sometimes, because that's our, our sinful human nature. If I said, for the rest of the service, I do not want you to look at the back of the room. There's something back there I don't want you to see. All eyes on me. Nobody look back there. Now, some of you are very compliant, and you probably would do okay with that, but there are some of you who are going, I want to know what's back there. Maybe while all heads are bowed and all eyes are closed, I can get a quick look during the prayer. You're you're, you're strategizing how you can look back because it's our nature. If the sign says wet paint, what do you do? I wonder if it's still wet. I mean, there's just something about us, right? It's just how we think. God said, there's one name I want you to honor. Only one, one name I want you to honor. And I want you to not misuse that name. It's the name of God. And what's the name that people use to curse? The only name we were told not to. Nobody says, oh, Jeff Bezos. You know, I mean, they they don't do that, right? We, We misuse the one name we were told not to because we have a sinful human nature. So sin is the problem. And, and the result of that is our third word, death. Because we've all sinned, we will all die. Romans 5.12 says, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death came to all mankind because all sinned. If you know the account of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they ate the forbidden fruit. God said, look, I just have one rule for you. And it was really a test as much as anything. Will you trust me enough to obey? One rule, don't eat from this tree. And they did. They broke the one rule. And God said, it's going to lead to death. Now, when I was a kid, this confused me. Because I thought it would be like poison. You eat the fruit, you die. And they didn't die as soon as they ate the fruit. And I was confused by that for a while. But I began to understand that when God created them, they could have lived in an eternal state at that time. But their failure began the death process. Their bodies began to break down. The time came when they died physically. But physical death is not the problem. The problem was spiritual death. It was the separation, the isolation, the barrier, excuse me, that was set up between us and God. Now, look, it's not that God doesn't love us as sinners. I mean, he does. It's that we could not handle being in his presence guilty. It's like a fish trying to live on dry land. We, we just wouldn't, we wouldn't work in God's presence as sinners. It would be like a human being trying to exist 60,000 feet in the air. Not enough oxygen there. We just could not survive. We are not equipped to be in God's presence. You, you know, you put a sinner in the presence of God, it's kind of like that scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Your face melts off. I mean, I don't know, but I'm just saying, we are not set up to be able to be that way until he stepped in for us. And that's the fourth word, Jesus. 
Jesus died in our place. Jesus took our punishment upon himself. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There are three words that we talk about a good bit related to understanding what God's been up to in the world and in our lives. The first word is justice, and that's where you get what you deserve. And we like justice when other people get what they deserve. We just don't like it for us. But then there's mercy, and that's where you don't get what you deserve. Punishment is withheld. But then there's grace, and that's where you get more than you deserve. You get what you don't deserve, and it's a beautiful thing. I'm not going to play this out long. We don't have time. But, but if, I, if I get a ticket, and I have to go to court, and I'm in court, and the judge says that's going to be $180. Ouch. Well, you broke the law. You've got to pay the price. But let's suppose that the judge gets up from the bench and steps down and pays the money for me. The judge, he or she, has, has upheld the law. The penalty was, was declared. The penalty was, was to be paid. But then in mercy, they said, Mark, you don't have to pay it. And in grace, they paid it for me. And God said, look, sin brings death. But I got an idea. How about the perfect one pays the penalty for you and for me? And that changes everything. Jesus died in our place, which leads then to our decision. And the fifth word here is faith. Faith restores our relationship with God that was broken through sin. Romans 5.1, since we've been justified or made right through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have faith in what Christ did for us. Now, faith is not just belief. It's not just sort of nodding your head saying, okay, yeah, I, I, I can agree with that. Faith is, is kind of belief in action. I, I like this picture. I heard this years and years ago. Let's suppose that we take a field trip, church trip. We're going to Niagara Falls. We're all there together, and there's this this stunt man, whatever, who has a tightrope stretched across Niagara Falls. And he walks across from one side to the other, and we just shout. It's amazing. Then he gets a wheelbarrow over there, and he pushes it back. And man, we're going crazy now. It looks so hard, and he's able to do that. Then he says, how many of you believe that I could put a person in the wheelbarrow and push them across? And we say, yes, we believe. You're, un you're incredible. Yes, we, we believe. And then he says, okay, I need a volunteer. Okay, belief says, I think you could put somebody in the wheelbarrow. Maybe my boss, I'd like to volunteer them. Or, or maybe my daughter's boyfriend, you know, or I believe my stepmother, you know, or, you know, mother-in-law. Well, I don't know, whatever. Okay, belief says you could put somebody in the wheelbarrow, but, but faith says I will get in. All in. All in. And, and, and so faith is kind of a belief in action. So what, what then are the actions that come from our faith? And one of them certainly is repentance. It's the next word. We change the direction of our lives. Romans 6 begins this way. What shall we say? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? The New Living Translation says, should we keep on sinning so God can show us more grace? There was actually a Russian monk several centuries ago who taught this very thing. He said, I will sin more so I can get more grace. And Paul said, that's such a twisted way of thinking. It, it, this is not a transactional thing where, okay, as long as there's more grace at the end than my sins, it's all good. And so I'm going to sin, sin, sin so I can get more and more grace. No, 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 no. The goal is to die to sin. Our goal is to put sin behind us, to change direction. Now, we're never going to do that perfectly in this life, but that's the goal. And so we repent. You're not going to be sinless, but as you mature, you ought to sin less. Billy Graham said repentance means being sorry enough to quit. And so that's the goal, certainly, of our lives, our response of faith. But also in this whole equation is baptism. Immersion embodies new life in Christ. Let me read these verses to you, then I'll explain a little bit more. Romans 6, verse 3 says, Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Baptism is like an outward symbol of what God is doing inside of us. Now, to be clear, we are not, we're not saying we're right and everybody else is wrong. We're not judging other churches, but we, we do not baptize babies here because we don't believe in original sin in the sense that they're born guilty. But we also do not, I mean, we baptize by immersion. We put people all the way under the water. There's a baptistry right behind me here. And, and we, we immerse for three reasons. One, because the New Testament was written in Greek, and the Greek word is baptizo, which means to put underwater. It's just what the word means. It was, you know, the, the mode was changed later on. But also, the Bible says that the baptism is a symbol of a cleansing. It's just a head to toe, you're washed clean. Not the removal of dirt from the body, Peter says, but it's, it's, what's, it's, it's the, the change that's happening inside. But also, here, Paul says, it's a symbol of a burial. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again in baptism. The old person dies and is buried under the water and raised up to live a new life. Nothing magical about the water, but it's a symbol of what God's up to. And some people say, well, it's just a symbol. It's not that important. But symbols are important. I wear a ring on the third finger of my left hand that says I belong to Gail. If I went to her and said, honey, you know, I'm not sure if I like what that says to people. They think, oh, you belong to her. And I'm just not comfortable with that. Could I just not wear that anymore? Could I come stay at your house? I'm not sure it's going to go over very well. You, you know what I'm saying? Because that symbol is important. If you put a flag on your doorstep for people to wipe their feet on when they come in, an American flag, that's going to infuriate some people, not because of the material it's made out of, but because of the symbol that it represents. So symbols are important. We're not trying to say we're, we're the only ones who figured it out. I'm just saying we think it's really important. And, and so that's, that's how we practice that. To be a member at our church, I just want to be clear, that, that is a part of our response to Christ. Okay. The, the, the eighth word in our list here is the word providence. It's what God is up to in us. He's working in us. He's working through us in this life. You know, sometimes I hear people say, man, Christianity, all they ever do is talk about heaven, going to heaven someday when you die. My life is such a mess right now. I'm just trying to survive today. I can't think about what's going to happen after I die. And my response is, it's what's going to happen after I die that gets me through today. It's what I know is coming that allows me to handle whatever comes. You know what I'm saying? And so, so God is up to something in us every day, getting us ready for what's to come. Romans 8.28 says, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I love how the New Living Translation and others say it, that God works all things together for good. doesn't mean everything's going to be good. Just If you come to Christ, brace yourself. It's not going to all be good. But God can bring good out of everything. I'm not a baker, okay? For me to talk about baking a cake is kind of ridiculous. I've never baked a cake in my life. But I know that when you put stuff in, some things by themselves are pleasant, right? Milk, a little butter on your finger tastes pretty good. You put sugar in there. That's all pleasant and nice. But you also put vanilla in there, and you put some raw eggs in there, and maybe some other stuff. I don't know. Um, but some of those things are pleasant by themselves. Some are unpleasant. But the thing is, you put it all together, and the outcome is better than any of the individual parts. And I believe that God works that way in our lives. It's not all going to be easy. It's not all going to be fun and pleasant. Okay, there's going to be some hard things, but God has the ability to put it all together and to bring good out of it. That's his promise. And so he's at work. He is at work. And if you surrender to him, he will work in you and through you. Now, that's that ninth word, surrender. And I'm not talking surrender here like come to Christ, that one time of surrender. We all need to do that. I'm talking about the daily surrender stuff. Clay talked about this verse last week, Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy or because of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. It's like we just come to God every day and say, God, here I am today. Yesterday had its ups and downs. I crawled off the altar a couple of times yesterday. 
but I want to be yours today. And so it's this daily surrender. God, work in me. Work through me. I want to be yours today. People talk about commitment. Oh, be committed to Christ. And that's not a bad thing. But surrender is different. When you surrender, you give up. And you don't unsurrender because you've surrendered. We surrender to Christ and we do it every day. So think about those words. God, sin, death, Jesus, faith, repentance, baptism, providence, surrender. There is a God and we've all failed him and because we failed him we're going to die. The beautiful news is that Jesus died in our place. And so if we have faith in what he has done for us. But faith is more than just belief. We're going to repent of our sins. We, we're baptized into Christ and then he's at work in our lives. And daily surrender. This picture of grace. The bottom line today very simply is that grace is God's response to every challenge in our lives. I want you to let that sink in, really. Grace is God's response to every challenge in our lives. Every problem is met with grace if we seek it. Every need, every failure, every doubt, every question, every sin, every loss, every pain, every chain. Grace is God's response to that. That's his promise. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but I've been wearing handcuffs during this. Of course, you noticed. I mean, we're in a small room, right? You know I've got handcuffs on. My hand gestures have stunk today, okay? I mean, you should have seen me trying to take communion. You can't take the bread if you don't put the juice down because it's going to be all over you, right? Um, first service, I forgot to turn my microphone on. The first song is going. I got handcuffs on. I can't reach my microphone. So I'm trying to uh, get myself out of these. So I, yeah, anyway, yeah. I do not have leg irons on. I'm not all bound up like Houdini used to do, okay? My point is this. A lot of people go through life like this. They can still function. They're not totally incapacitated. I've been able to preach today handcuffed. I just haven't enjoyed it very much. It's uncomfortable, it's inconvenient, it's frustrating. And there are people who go through their lives and they don't even realize that they're handcuffed. They don't even realize the chains that are binding them. All they know is something's not right. Something's missing, something's frustrating, something's discouraging. Maybe something is bringing despair and they don't know what to do about it. And friends, I believe the answer, I believe the key. Man, am I glad I have a key. Let, let me just see here. I'm, I'm not great at this, but I'm getting better. I've been practicing. Uh-oh. Come on. Come on, baby. I'll go the other way. Oh, oh man, that feels good. Okay. I told him in first service, I, I, I thought it'd be really dramatic if I threw these in the baptistry, but then I'd have to go in and get them. And so I decided <laughs> that probably fishing them out was not going to be my best plan. You know what? It feels good to have those off. It feels good to be, to be, what's the word? Free, right? It's good to be unbound. And God says, look, your life, do you, do you realize what's going on in your life? Do you realize how, how tangled up things are, how bound you are? I want to help. I've got this offer. I've got this gift. And man, if you will take it, you're not going to believe what I've got in mind. In the next four weeks, we're going to talk about when we engage with grace, what on earth God's up to, because it's amazing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your power at work in us. We thank you for the fresh start that you offer. We thank you, God, that you have provided grace that we might be saved. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing this last song and certainly it's going to be about grace and the offer is available man if you need to talk to somebody about next steps if you need to talk about your walk with Christ I'd be glad to talk with you we have <clears throat> others in our church both men or women who would be glad to talk with you God let me know God let us know and we will because no decision you're ever going to make is more important than this one